Helen and Focal Plane and Comfia Biologists for having me um, today. I'm super excited to tell you all about a new project, um, Microtutor. Uh, I also want to point out, while I have a bit of an audience here, that my title has changed recently. Um, my core is no longer an icon imaging center, so we've given it a new name, um, hence the new title. So this, uh, I'll start by just saying that this is a big collaboration. There's a large group of us, all imaging scientists, um, and we're working to put together this interactive microscopy course I will tell you about, which will be integrated into the global bioimaging training portal. I'm not gonna mention everybody now, um, but I'll point out some of the people who have been instrumental, uh, particularly in this first course. Uh, I do have to acknowledge from my group, Anna Jost, who has been managing the project, and Eva de la Serna, who is a um, postdoctoral fellow in my group. And uh, she has uh, really been doing a lot of work on this project and also is a fantastic artist. So you'll see a lot of her original artwork as, we, um, as I go through the talk. All right, so the primary objective of this project is to facilitate self-learning of the fundamental principles of biology and emphasis on the fundamental principles. Um, I think those of us who teach microscopy know how incredibly important it is that you as students learn the fundamental principles. And so just as an example, um, the point spread function is something that microscopists talk endlessly about. It is um, the, the result of um, diffraction and inter interference has on the ability of a lens to focus light. And there are so many principles um, that you might be interested as you're thinking about more advanced techniques that you just simply, this is just some I thought out of the top of my head when I was putting this talk together, that you will not be able to understand deeply and to really use effectively without understanding these fundamental principles. So we wanted to focus on those. Um, and we also wanted to create an interactive course. So um, uh, something that you, you that is more than just um, the typical lectures and such that are seen online. Um, you may be thinking, and rightly so, that there are already lots of available um, sources for education in microscopy. And uh, just pointing out some of, uh, well, my own, um, but also some of the really big and excellent efforts that have been made in this area um, throughout the years. So there are a lot of recorded lectures. Boy, the pandemic, they really exploded. Um, and plenty of texts that you can read through um, if, if you wanna learn microscopy. There's also a handful of really good animations and simulators out there. Um, but this doesn't make a course. This is teaching content, this is learning content. And so an effective course requires more than that. Um, and the reason why is it's just hard to learn microscopy on your own. There is a lot to learn. Um, and it's really hard to know where to start. There's so much material uh, online and it varies in quality to be quite honest. Um, and you're gonna have questions. It's really hard when you're working through this stuff on your own to just feel completely satisfied um, and, and to not wanna dig in with an expert um, if you're truly interested in learning this stuff. And so this is where Microtutor uh, is, is here to help you. Um, so the, what we want for Microtutor is, is the following. The, the way we want to turn this into a course is by first providing a guided curriculum. I'll go through this list now and then uh, hit each point through the talk. Um, curated content, interactive experience, opportunities for self-assessment and recognition of your achievements as you work through the course, and help from expert instructors. Um, so for the guided curriculum, the, the idea here is that we will provide a curriculum in the course that is designed by experts. Um, and the reason why you need a curriculum is as a student, you're not, you don't know what you need to learn, right? You have a learning objective. You want to, let's say, learn how STED works. But there's a lot of fundamentals you really need to build up before you're going to be able to get to that. And so the idea here is we microscopy expert uh, teachers are going to present the material in the order you need to learn it in order to really master um, what you're trying to achieve. So the first course that we are going to release, which I will tell you will be in June, um, uh, the curriculum was developed by myself with Anna Jose, Michelle Atana, and Eva Ilicerna, who I've already mentioned. And the way we're going to guide you through this is we're going to lock it. Um, so as you're working your way through the course, you will need to complete the material 
in the order in which we have uh, presented it. And so as you see here, the course is made up of multiple chapters and within each chapter, there's one or more lessons. Um, and so I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but I'll just say that for the fluorescence microscopy curriculum, we're, we're doing what we want um, the course to do in general, which is, as I've said multiple times now, give you a, a, a good understanding of the fundamental principles, but we also want you to feel like you have things that you can immediately apply to your own work. Some, so some practical information that we can, we can give to you fully because you now have these um, uh, fundamentals uh, behind you. And so, <clears throat> for example, the, the first course is going to start off uh, on fluorescence microscopy. We'll start off with just a deep understanding of what fluorescence is and the issues around using the fluorescence reaction as a mode to generate contrast in microscopy. And then the microscope itself, the components that are necessary and why they're necessary and how to deal with those components um, to build a fluorescence microscope. And then practical considerations that once you understand the fluorescence reaction and um, how we visualize that in the fluorescence microscope, these various issues that many of us have to deal with um, and uh, when they're a problem, how to determine if they're a problem for you, et cetera. Curated content. Um, so basically, you know, there's no reason to start from scratch for this sort of course. We are using good stuff that's already out there, some of the good content that I, that I mentioned previously. Um, so what we're doing is assessing existing content for whether it's appropriate for our curriculum. And um, once we identify things, we're reaching out to the video creators um, or content creators for permission and for files, as I'll mention. Um, and then we are also creating new content to fill out our curriculum as is needed. So we've curated a database of 600 uh, existing videos uh, already out there. And we've reviewed 50 of them that were appropriate content for fluorescence microscopy. And the process we're using here to curate content is two of the group of, of collaborators I showed you at the beginning and we'll show you again at the end. Um, uh, two of us review the videos. We score it using a standardized rubric that, rubric that um, Anna developed. And uh, the highest ranking videos are then um, reviewed by two additional folks from our group. And then the entire group needs to approve the final content. Uh, and so we, uh, the a heart of the the um, course is short video clips. We found as we were put, we've learned a lot putting this together, um, and we learned that short video clips make a lot more sense in this sort of course. So the the video uh, videos we're we're looking at full length videos, but we're choosing clips that are most appropriate. Um, and so uh, this is the sort of format of the video pages where we have, of course, the video creator and then learning objectives so that before you watch the video, you can have a good idea of what you're supposed to be getting out of that. Um, and then we are providing closed captions for those who would like to have them. Uh, interactive experience. So interactive learning has been shown to decrease academic disparities um, among underrepresented folks and um, folks like me from, from a, a, a underrepresented socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, and uh, Elnaz Fazeli from um, University of Helsinki was super helpful uh, getting us, uh, educating us on the, on the different types of interactive content that's out there. And um, so she introduced us to some and we, we looked through them and, and found the, the ones that we thought would be us for this platform, which is we're building it on Moodle, which is an open source learning management system. And we're using H5P, which is an HTML5 uh, file format that allows for interactive web. All right, so what do I mean by interactive? Here's a, a video from Nico Sturman from my biology where we've added pop-ups, for example, to define terms that he's using. Um, and to provide continuity, one of the things is we're doing is bringing in figures and, and such from, from previous videos that you have seen to sort of bring, uh, pull the content together. Um, an example of some of the interactive content that, that Eva has created, here we are sliding a slider back and forth to look at the excitation light path with and without the actual light. So you can be thinking about what's going on there. On the practical side, so you know, one of the things we do in the fluorescence microscopy course is teach you about different types of light sources. So then you're gonna go back to your microscope 
And do you know what kind of light source you have? So here we have an interactive flow chart to help you figure out which type of light source you're actually using at your microscope so you understand the limitations of it. Um, and just some very practical things, what you're looking for in front of the microscope to figure out what you're using. Uh, Brian Millis from Vanderbilt has been fantastic. He is a blender guy. Um, and so he has put together things like this. In the lab, when we're teaching fluorescence microscopy, we have people disassemble filter sets to really understand and demystify what's going on in there. Obviously, that's difficult to do um, virtually. And so Brian has, has uh, been fantastic making us some custom blender um, uh, videos for the course. Self-assessment and recognition of achievement. So when you're working through this sort of material, of course, you know, you, as many of us would, might be questioning, am I really understanding this? Do I really get this? And so um, we want you to, to, to know as you're working through the course, if you're understanding the theory and if you are learning it in such a way that's going to let you put it into practice. And so we have lots of self-grading quizzes throughout the course that Anna really led the generation of these questions with some help from members of the community who su submitted ideas. Um, and the self-grading quizzes are throughout the course. So for example, you start every chapter with a pre-quiz. So this is to let you know where you are in the material. You know, some of us, I can tell you as a, as a microscopy teacher for many years that we have, you know, not everybody has a clear picture of where they are. Some people know much more than they realize. Some people know much less than they realize. So this will get you um, real about where you are in your learning journey. Um, and then at the end, you will uh, take another quiz to see how, how you've learned um, throughout the lesson. Um, we also have embedded quizzes into movies so that the movie will pause and ask you a question about the material or at the end of each movie, there is a quiz. Um, we all want to be told when we did a good job. So when you work through this, as you work through this course, Eva has made um, uh, some fun badges uh, that you can accumulate and tweet to help us um, uh, advertise the course. <laughs> Uh, and finally, help from instructors. So this is a tricky one, right, when you're developing an online course. But we have a couple of ideas we hope are going to work out well. Um, the big problem here, of course, is scalability. Uh, we want, we are hoping that this course will be used worldwide. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of you we know that need to learn microscopy. So how are we going to approach this for a large group worldwide? First, um, my group runs Microform, which is an online discussion group that's built on the same platform discourse as the very excellent and highly used image.sc. Um, and we're going to have a discussion group specifically for the particular uh, course that you're working through. So you can go to that and ask questions. Instructors will be monitoring that um, and uh, instructors from, from our group, as well as we hope other students that have worked through material will, will discuss it on the forum. We are also going to offer quarterly remote flipped classroom courses. And so the idea here, if you're not familiar with this teaching approach, is instead of the sort of typical instructor lectures, then student does, does uh, homework, the, in, in this case, we will uh, advertise a time, a schedule, when we you will be working through the course. So we will assign to you, for example, over this week, you should work through this particular part of the course. Then we will have scheduled um, online discussion groups with, with several of the instructors from our group initially. Um, and you'll be able to ask questions about that material. And then we'll continue that process through the entire, uh, helping you work through the entire course. So if you'd like more um, uh, interaction with instructors, we'll make that available to you as well. The course is self-contained. You don't need to have the instructors available. If you would like to just work through it uh, uh, on your own at your own pace, that will should work for you too. But uh, we're available if you need help in these formats. There are also some downloadable resources um, associated with MicroTutor, which includes poster size summaries of each chapter that you can uh, have for yourself, print out, hang around your lab, um, reference lists for all of the material that we've covered. And of course, these will only be available to you after you work through the course. They're the bonus at the end. Um, we also want to help those of you who, out there who are developing coursework in microscopy. Um, we need more microscopy teachers. And so we want to help you. I remember very well how much time and effort it takes to develop this sort of material. 
Um, and so we're going to provide the slide decks, which the uh, which we will have collected from the creators of the videos that will be available for you to download and use in your courses as you'd like. Um, we're collecting lab exercises and providing those, uh, for example, the ones from my Cold Spring Harbor course that are appropriate for, um, for the material. And we'll also set up a private discussion forum on micro forum for those of us who teach microscopy, microscopy so we can in private exchange ideas and, um, and such. Finally, I'll thank Chan Zuckerberg Initiative who uh, has funded this project. And I will point out um, again that we hope that the hope we're pretty sure we're going to have it done for you by June. Um, it is going to be integrated into the existing global bioimaging virtual training platform. Um, there's a link here with our mailing list, and we'll also make announcements um, on uh, Twitter and uh, Blue Sky. And um, I will also ask Helen to put it in the Focal Plane newsletter. So hopefully you will hear throughout our various community resources um, uh, when we have it up and running for you. And I'll just put our collaborators' um, uh, images up here uh, while I answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. That sounds um, amazing. So yeah, if anyone has any questions and you should be able to type them into the uh, Q&A um, box and then uh, yeah, Jennifer can address them. So um, maybe I can start. So you, this is the, um, obviously you have the chapters within the course, but this is the first module. Are there plans for more modules following this one or is it kind of a oh, see how this yes. goes pilot? Um. Okay, yeah, so now we have to talk about the difference between plans and things that will actually happen. <laughs> so this grant from CZI is a two-year grant and we're one year into it. Um, uh, and so just about one year into it. And so we have another year of funding and working out how to do this, um, how to put this course together was a lot. Um, and so now that we've done it, we think the next ones will go much quicker. Um, so we do have uh, plans to release uh, several more. I don't want to say how many because um, we're not quite sure how many we'll be able to get through. And I've also applied for another grant from the NIH that we hope if we get that, we'll be able to do a, a you know, some more. But I mean, we'd love to do, you know, a full set and cover the entire, it will, it will depend on whether we can find funding to continue it. Okay, okay so we have a question from Claire Mitchell. She asks, she says, um, amazing resource, Jennifer. Is there any plans for a suite of questions for quizzes? For example, if someone fails the quiz the first time round, will they get the same questions again and could answer the questions through memorization? Um, well, when you, uh, I'll, I'll first say that the purpose of the quizzes is for the student to uh, be able to assess whether they're learning the material. That's the main uh, part. We have discussed whether there should be some sort of certificate involved in, and that is something that longer term we would like to honestly, you know, when doing this sort of big project, you just need to prioritize and, and we deprioritized um, figuring out a way to know that people individually worked through the content. But getting back to the original question, there is um, uh, there's a couple of things there. First of all, you can always go back and retake um, the quizzes, except for the pre quiz that one you get one shot at. Um, but when you repeat the quizzes, the answers to the questions are jumbled each time. So uh, it would be difficult, I think, to um, to just memorize the right answers. <laughs> okay. And then uh, we have another question. So um, is the course free? Uh, if not, how much will it cost? Yes, sorry. I should have said that straight away. Absolutely. This is free for everyone and open to anyone who would want to take it. This is a community effort. Yeah. And and that includes the um, interactive sessions with the, the the tutors as well. Yes, absolutely. Everything we have no, we will not charge for this. This is absolutely going to be free and open for everyone. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, so I guess if there's no more questions, um, then I, well, I'm sure you can contact Jennifer uh, if you yes. do have any more questions that that come up as well um, by by all the platforms. Um, but we're uh, hand over to to Robert. Oh, we have maybe just squeeze in one quick question. How long is the course duration or expected duration? Sorry, Jennifer, you're on mute. 
Um, uh, I assume that means how long will it take to work through the course? Uh, of course, that's going to vary uh, uh, from person to person, but um, a few hours, two, three hours, I think, uh, if you were working through it sort of at a, a consistent pace, but it's very modular. Uh, part of what we wanted to do is make it easy for people to like walk away from it and come back. Um, and so the, it's it's sort of set up so that you can do little bits at a time when you when you have the time. Um, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so yeah, now we're going to move on to teaching in the bioimage analysis space. So um, Robert's going to tell us about cultivating open training to advance bioimage analysis. And again, if you have any questions, if you type them into the uh, Q and A box, and we'll uh, get them at the end. Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for the kind introduction, Helen. So also, in my case, my role also recently changed, even though it's already a couple of months ago. Um, I switched to a new institute. I'm now working at SCAD AI, which is a research center for artificial intelligence, one of big six big centers in Germany. Um, I'm also working at the National Research Data Management Infrastructure in Germany and in global in the Global Bioimage Analysis Society. We are facing on these three levels regionally, um, nationally, but also on the international level, we are facing very similar issues in the context of training. Um, and I would like to talk about that today. I also shared a link to my slides, so you can download my slides and you can reuse them for your training. And this is exactly what I want to talk about today. So I would like to cultivate an open training um, best practices in our society. So uh, these slides can be reused under the terms of the CC by 4.0 license, unless mentioned otherwise. This is what I often write on my slides, and many people do not know what this technically actually means and why it's there. So when you click on this link, you could read um, the website, Creative Commons, and you could read that this BY stands for by attribution. You can see that you can download these materials and you are free to share them, to redistribute them, you can adapt them. So you can basically take individual slides or figures out of my slides and put them into your slides. And unless or as long as you, for example, cite me and put a link to this license again. So it's actually quite easy, right? You just have to mention where it's from. Citing is a thing anyway, and you have to specify under which circumstances CC BY you can reuse these materials. And then when I was, for example, here, I was using from the open microscopy website, I was taking the screenshot, I was cropping a part out because I thought it's a nice image, nice visualization. And then uh, if I want to use that, um, I have to put the sentence below. So this figure was cropped from openmicroscopy.org licensed by the University of Dundee in the open microscopy environment under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. Pretty much the same thing I said before. And if you now wonder, that's the question which often comes up on the slide, do I really have to put this long sentence there? Yes, you have to, because that's exactly what CC BY says. And it's, I mean, also maybe a bit wasteful in space, but it's also quite simple and you can memorize that quite easily. Um, so here's another example. I hope Martin still is a friend of mine after I showed this slide. Um, here's another example of a different license. It's a restrictive license, CC by NC and D. Um, I would love to show you a figure from this paper, the care paper, the preprint of the care paper was like a milestone in our field. I would love to show you a figure but I cannot <laughs> because this license does not allow me to. So I cannot show you something from this paper and put it in my slides and then upload my slides to the internet. That's like illegal. That's what this license unfortunately says. So that's why I have to move on and have to give another example. Within you bias, we were over many years collecting a lot of slides, including myself. I was contributing this slide deck in 2018. And if we find it on the internet, I had super hard time to find it on the internet. I could not find it anymore. It's somewhere on a Google share, so hard to find. If you find these slide decks, you can learn from them a lot. You can go through them and they will be, I mean, they were prepared by multiple people, in multiple courses, worked over and over again. So it's great for learning these resources if you can find them. Um, but unfortunately, you cannot reuse them because we did not specify any copyright here. So you cannot download these slides, make your own training materials out of them, copy parts or figures, and sh then share these materials again. Because if there is no license specified, if unclear copyright is basically the problem, um, that means all rights reserved. So we are not allowed to just copy those things. Um, and that's what I refer to as not fair. I will come back to the fair principles in a couple of slides, 
But first, I would like to iterate on what actually what our community, what kind of problem we actually have. So there's somebody preparing some material and they maybe share it to somebody else in a private channel or online or whatever, but they do not write down what the copyright, what the license is. So the second person who has this material in their own hands cannot be sure how to share that, how to publish that, how to give this to the world. So they typically do not do it. So everybody keeps their slides for themselves. Everybody shares slides in private, but nobody or not many people are putting them on the internet, making them reusable. But if the first person would have specified that these materials are available under that license and can be reused, then the second person could also stick to the same rules and then make new material and publish it on the internet. And if we would all work like this, and that's what I mean with changing our culture, um, if we would all do this, there would be this circular loop that we can improve our materials, share them on the internet, somebody else can download them, make their own materials out of it, and then upload them to the internet again. So that would be fantastic. We could improve from generation to generation and rework materials nicely. And this is... Um, often uh, there's often an, another problem in a similar context. You see it in, in, in science experiments, but you see it also in training. So first of all, we plan an experiment, we acquire some image data, we do some data analysis, we write a paper about it, or we plan a training and we acquire trainers and we, we, we get attendees to the course, then we prepare the materials and we conduct the workshop. And then by the end, when the paper is in writing or when the workshop is done, then we are wondering, are we, are we allowed to, to publish the slides or the code or <laughs> the materials? And, and we don't know. And with license, and it's super hard to figure out at that point in time. It's simply too late. We have to discuss that earlier. So for example, at the very beginning, when the project is started, maybe when the grant proposal is written, or even before the people are hired who should work on this project, we should decide that the data and the stuff, the materials will be shared under the CC BY 4.0 license. And we should also write down responsibilities. Robert is going to do this by the end of 2025. And if we do that, we write it down in the data management plan. That's why funding agencies are asking us for this document. And if we do that, um, then everybody can stick to these things. If there is a course planned, which the materials will be shared under this license, and you ask a trainer, hey, do you want to join us? Do you want to teach together with us? We will share the materials under CC BY. The trainer can at that point in time decide if it's okay for them to share their materials under this license, or can just say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't have materials which can be shared like that. So the, the, the earlier you have this discussion about which license, um, the clearer it is for everyone. Also, I would claim, even I do not have like numbers for this, but I would claim if at the beginning of a project, it's decided that I have to publish something by the end, I will also spend more time in making the materials better. So I would presume, I would argue that the quality is higher if I know that in two years, this thing will be online and my name will be written on it. Um, so that brings us to the fair principles. And I would like to quickly go through them. Findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. I think most of you should have heard about it. And if not, it's not a big deal because these things are rather new. The document describing this way of data sharing, fair sharing, um, was uh, written in 2016. And if you think about the new bias trading materials I showed earlier, which are not fair, um, new bias was running between 2015 and 2020. So if if we didn't know that the FAIR principles existed, if we did not stick to them, I personally did not know about them in 2018, seriously. Um, it's okay, it's fine. <laughs> we, cannot, we cannot follow principles which are just about to be established. But nowadays they are established. Many funding agencies mention them and you have to stick to them if you apply for funding. So I think we could stick to them now. We just need to change our culture a little bit. And that's why I'm here today. So one question would be, for example, okay, where can I share materials? And depending on the content, depending on what you want to share, you should choose different platforms. I think everybody is aware of the bio archive and I think also Figshare and uh, GitHub, everybody has heard before. Um, Zenodo is always a very nice platform. Focal Plane, of course, <laughs> to, to share, for example, blog posts. So there's like multiple platforms for different content. But uh, the point I would like to make here is try to avoid institutional servers. Because if, for example, somebody searches for, for source code or for coding training materials, they will certainly have a look on github.com but they may not have a look on 
git.randomuniversity.de. <laughs> so it's, it's very unlikely that people can find stuff if it's on institutional servers, even though your institute may tell you that it would be great if you would share your materials there. Pick the right platform for the kind of data you want to share and also look around what other people in your community are using. Because if everybody in your community is posting stuff on the bioimage archive, then you may want to share your data there as well. Because there, then people will have a look. They know. <clears throat> and furthermore, do not trust, for example, Google that stuff can be found afterwards. So in particular, when you share training materials and you search them with Google, you will not find them. It's so hard to find good training materials. And that's why you have to put them into specific databases. So for bioimage analysis, there's, for example, the Bioimage Informatics Index. It's a project of new bias back in the days. There's microscopy DB where you can upload, where you can link materials. Um, we are also building up a similar thing for NFDI for bioimage. And if you are more on the bioinformatics side, maybe bio.tools is the right platform. And I'm sure there are more platforms like that. So you put a link to your resource in all of these search engines, will, which fit, I hope at some point, these search engines will also exchange data with each other so that everything can be found everywhere. That would be great. Um, but yet you may have to put your link in multiple resources. It costs you five minutes or 10 minutes to put a link there and a short description and maybe some additional metadata. But the impact is big because suddenly your stuff can be found and people will reuse these materials. You spend so much time in, share, in preparing and sharing. Um, incentive. So what happens if your stuff is findable? That's, for example, the situation. Hey, Robert, do you remember the talk in 2020, 2021? Uh, uh, which talk? <laughs> Where are the slides? <laughs> yeah, I can search for my own slides now because they are in this one resource where I was sharing all my slides and then everybody can download them, including myself. Do you think I would find these slides on my hard drive after three years? It's pretty unlikely. So it's yeah, it's somewhere in this folder, but I can't recall. So Make it online findable and you will find it yourself. Um, there's also this visibility aspect, um, depending on, for example, what kind of job you have. I'm now a training coordinator. I'm building up a training center. So it makes a lot of sense that our training materials can be found online so that people know about us, <laughs> for example, in these social networks. Um, and here I put in particular GitHub and YouTube. There are also social networks. You can link stuff, you can uh, like things, you can look what other people are liking, so it's like a social network like Twitter or X these days. And so I would say open and fair training materials are a good PR instrument. They will lead to more software users. If you are a software developer, if you are an image analysis workflow developer, share your training materials online and other people will know about your stuff and they will use your things. And then they will, for example, may come to your courses you're organizing and you will have new collaborations. So this is how in particular software developers and image analysis can make sure that their future in academia, for example, is secured by being seen, by having collaborations. And this is how you can make collaborations by sharing of stuff openly. And then if you look further and further down in the fair principles, there's this R for reusable. If you look for the technical definition, it's like it has a lot to do with metadata if you go through these bullet points. And I would like to highlight this one point I was also highlighting at the very beginning. It is important that you share your things, your materials with clear and accessible data usage licenses. And um, if you if you manage so, then people will reuse your material. To you see here two slide decks, both shared on F1000 Research. Um, they are not identical, but they are very similar. So I was sharing this stuff. Oh, let me check. That's not clear. 2021. I was sharing the slide deck in 2021. And Martin Schatz uh, from Prague, from the Charles University in Prague, was downloading these slides, modifying them a bit, and then uploading them again because he was conducting a similar course. So he was basically teaching what I was teaching before, my tool, how to use my tools, my Fiji plugins, um, and with that spreading the word and also sparing time in preparing his own course material. So this is kind of a snowball effect. If you, again, have like cool stuff to show, cool stuff to use, then you can spread, make other people spread the word about it. Um, how can you make things reusable? Yeah, I use as an example, I use the BioArchive website. If you upload a preprint to the BioArchive, you come at some point to this page. And yes, you're busy, you don't have much time, so you will just randomly <laughs> select one of those licenses, but you can also use some time and read them at least a little bit in detail. Um, so for example, if you look very carefully, that the first two licenses here in this list, the first two Creative Commons licenses tell you 
that you share these materials under the condition that they can be reshared, but only in an unaltered way. And taking a figure out of it is an alteration. So if you select these two, you will make sure that nobody can talk about your science. <laughs> and I'm not sure if this is the goal. So please be careful when you do this. Also here, um, these two can, other people can reshare your stuff, but only for non-commercial purposes. And the question is, what does commercial actually mean? Because depending on who you talk to, there's a quite a debate about that. So I'm again, I'm building up a training center. And if people come to our trainings, they will pay money. We use this money to fund the training center to do more trainings in the future. That sounds commercial, no? <laughs> so it's not clear if like me in academia, uh, uh, is this a commercial thing or not? But I will just avoid reusing materials which are li si licensed like that because I want to be sure that the people who are hired here and the group we are building up um, is fine. And that's why I basically prefer things which are shared under this, under this license where it basically says, Anyone can share, reuse, remix, or adapt this material for any purpose. Again, under the condition that they have to mention you and that you have to link to this license. So and I think in particular in science, you actually want other people to reuse your materials and to talk about your stuff and to show it with your name below. So it makes so much sense to use this particular license. Just summarizing these different licenses again. So there are these different names, CC BY, CC BY NC for non-commercial, ND for no derivatives where you cannot modify the material. And if you wonder, can I download this stuff and share it for free again? So for example, with students in a course, uh, yes, you can download even the ND papers and give them to the students, but you are not allowed to take a figure out of it. So that's the second point here. Uh, am I allowed to take figures and then reuse them, for example, in my slides? In these last two cases, because of the non-derivatives, you are not. Um, can I organize paid trainings? And most of the trainings are somehow paid because there are always costs associated with it. Um, then it becomes a problem also for this one. And I would argue that this kind of island um, of licenses for specific purposes are bad for the progress of science, in particular in the training context. We cannot reuse these materials for training. And that's why we can we have to prepare the same materials over and over, or we cannot talk about certain topics at all because it's hard to make materials of that kind. So again, if you share your stuff under a non-derivatives or non-commercial license, it might be fine. <laughs> But if you do so, please have a good reason. And if you have the time, also drop me an email and tell me what these reasons are, because I would really like to understand better why so many materials are shared under these two licenses. They are quite popular in our field, and I think it's the fault of our community. Um, yeah, so these two prohibit the, the reuse of your materials, for example, in paid training. So please, if you do that, have a good reason for doing that. Um, so my take home message, my first take home message, the nice one, uh, <laughs> or the simple one is, if you share material openly or not, please put a license statement in there so that whoever receives your material knows under which circumstances, under which conditions they can reuse it. And then it will be much harder to steal these materials. You will less likely find them online in some other materials because you tell them you, they can reuse it or they cannot. Um, and then this other thing, Please <laughs> use DC by and forget about DC by NC or ND. And if you if you know good reasons for NC and ND, please drop me an email that I can think about it and maybe make some additional slides for my next talk in a similar topic. So as a summary, again, you can download my slides and you can reuse them in your training. Um, if you want to read more about um, this particular topic, I wrote a rewrote a preprint together with Christian Tischer, Pete Bankhead, Kota Miura, and Beth Simini something like a month ago. Um, and there is some blog posts on the focal plane about sharing data on Zenodo, sharing on Figshare by Elizabeth Kugler, um, collaboratively working on things together on GitHub, and a blog post in particular about licensing, which is also summarizing the stuff again, which I was presenting here today. And last but not least, I would like to thank uh, my former team in Dresden, all the communities I'm part of. We are all pushing in the similar direction in the training context and um, the funding entities. And DALI, of course, for generating some of my slides, which I can reuse freely. <laughs> and I thank you for your attention. <laughs> 
Thanks, Robert. That was a great talk. Um, so again, if you have any uh, questions for Robert or you want to tell him why you should use the ND NC licenses, then please uh, type those into the uh, uh, Q&A box. Um, so I, I have a question related to the ND. So if someone does license their work with ND on there and then you drop them an email to say, oh, can I use your work can you at that point or have they kind of locked themselves by using that license you you can reuse it um if you for example want to share these things under cc by uh, you have to also ask them explicitly in your email and this is the point where often they answer yeah you can reuse it but if you want to share it under a different license i'm not sure so often people just are not aware of all these licenses um so that's a bit that's a bit tricky um also the other tricky thing is that if you have the allowance to use something and it's only via email, so you have an email saying that you can reuse it, if you then share your materials and somebody else wants to reuse them, do they have to send the same email to the same person again? Or can you put this email in the slide? Like, if you're okay that your stuff is reused, write it there and then other people can reuse it. I'm also, I presume also, if I send an email to someone and ask, can I please reuse your stuff? The likelihood that they respond is higher because it's me <laughs> and other people make it less responsive. And that's yeah. not how it's supposed to be. So if you if you're okay with your stuff being reused, write it down publicly. <laughs> okay, so we have a question. Um the, it says the issue of licensing is so important and very badly understood. So thank you. A provocative question. Are we in the age of AI where data uh, has been used for training indiscriminately, regardless of copyright licensing? Isn't it strange to be worrying about this now? <laughs> yeah, in particular, it's so hard to reproduce what AI was trained on. <laughs> when you think about OpenAI, ChatGPT, what were these models actually trained on? Nobody knows. I mean, I guess some people know, but it's not publicly known. Um, but I like it as context a lot. And that's why I'm also using DALI for making figures, um, at least in the American law. And Jennifer, maybe correct me if I, if I say wrong things, but I heard that artificial intelligence produces something. You cannot have copyright on it because it was not made by a human. Um, and copyright is a thing which is entirely limited to humans. Um, and I, I, I like this a lot because what if I take my slide and just ask Dali to, you know, beautify it a bit? Is it then made by AI and nobody can have copyright on it? So it's indeed a, a very fascinating age. And uh, I think laws have to be modified a little bit in the next years to deal with the AI aspect in very general. Right. Can I ask a question? Please go ahead. Robert. I'm I'm really curious about your um your thinking that the your your thoughts that that um we should be making materials uh open for commercial. Am, am I understanding that properly? I mean I, I can understand that you're saying that that if somebody is has a course and they're charging, that could maybe be an issue. But I, I have two thoughts about it. One is this is sticky for in microscopy because every one of the major microscope manufacturers who make a lot of money off of us mm -hmm. um, have educational sites. And it's actually happened that things generated by my group have wound up places. Um, and I personally have had slides in people's seen pe slides in people's lectures without um, acknowledgments. So yeah, I, I just want to challenge that. Um, why should grant funded, you know, uh, projects that are funded by grants, uh, by taxpayers' money, be made free to be reused by companies? Um, so, I mean, if companies. Or is there reuse something this... I'm misunderstanding? <laughs> No, no, no. I, I think, I mean, I, I would not make a difference between companies and academic reuse. Um, the, the point is the following um, I'm paid by, by taxpayers' money and um, by public money, and the stuff I produce should be available to the public again. So that includes companies, so they can reuse my materials, and now comes the fun. If I share my materials under a specific license, and for example, CC BY says you are allowed to reuse this, but you have to write that it was made by robot. Um, and you can, make oh, yeah. it as, it was, you can make it as specific, you can say it was made by Robert from the University of Leipzig. Then it would be a free advertisement for the University of Leipzig 
in the trading materials of a company. So the company would suddenly would advertise. Not, <laughs> in my in my case, this would not be allowed because Harvard oh, has really? strict rules about re, about use of their name. Yeah, ah, I, see. So I, I personally would not be able to do that. Um, okay. Yeah, just because of Harvard rules, but but I don't but, know. but your your name could be on it. My name could be on it. Yeah, I, I I'd love to challenge you on the commercial thing though because I think um. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with you 100% that we should be sharing these materials, especially training materials, right? Um, yeah, I, 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 two companies in, in particular, uh, without, well, without any, you know, exchange of of uh, discussion of what they're going to be used for, et cetera. So I, that, yeah. that part, I'm not sure I agree with you, but I very much appreciate the general message that we should all be using this. Um, and I can tell you that... Uh, that we will be doing such on on microtutor. So, yeah. Yeah, just 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 another argument. Um, the other thing is that we hardly find any time to to make uh, advanced training materials because we are so busy making basic training materials all day because we have to remake them all the time because we cannot reuse them. Um, and what do I care about a company making money with my basic training materials? So. Um, <laughs> I, I disagree. <laughs> We're working really hard. To, I disagree just because we work so hard in my group to build these sorts of tools and then to see a company take it and put it on their website, which probably gets a lot more traffic. It's mm -hmm. now publicly available. They're making money out of it. How am I going to get another grant, Robert, from, from the government to build these tools if they're just being taken by companies? And so anyway, but we're, we're getting too much <laughs> into this and it's not the major topic here, but I would love to chat with you about it sometime. Because I think there is a bit more to that than maybe we're, we're thinking. Yes, Steve comments, is, is Jennifer just providing a justification for NCND? But I think we're just talking about NC here, not necessarily yeah. ND. Yeah. I guess, yeah. how would you feel, Absolutely. Jennifer, about someone taking a, a figure from your training material to use for their own? I guess you... 100% fine with that. I share slides, you know, I share the microtutor, or sorry, microcourses slides. We're gonna make everything available in microtutor. I'm fine with that and and generally do use an NC license on, on the stuff that we do. Great. Um, okay, so I guess if we have no more questions, um, we'll have to organize some debates uh, in the future so we can uh, get uh, all, all parties involved, maybe get a lawyer in to discuss the, all the details <laughs> and everything would be a fun thing to do in the future. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer and Robert, for your fantastic talks um, and for presenting here. And yeah, thank you all for attending and for your questions. And please look out for our next um, webinar, uh, which is gonna be on open microscopy. Thank you. <laughs>